Welcome everyone to the Berwick Public Library. We have a really exciting program tonight and a beautiful night, thank goodness, to have it. Um, I wanted to introduce you to Robert W. Spencer. Robert lives with his wife um, in a the last of nine mine mill buildings, which once drew hydropower from Waterford's City Brook. And forgive me for reading, but you're so interesting. You have such a, oh, I want to read every, everyone right. to know. <laughs> um, his writing desk sits above the breached split rock dam. He's a graduate of University of Massachusetts in Amherst and Radcliffe Landscape Design Seminars, now Boston Architectural College. Spencer ran a design build residential garden practice in the greater Boston area for 20 years. He's also founded the Irish Limestone. Yeah. Um, and you can talk about that. Yeah, sure. Yeah, a company which imported and distributed this spe specialty stone to the design and construction trades in the Northeast. So I look forward to hearing about that. You were a resident of Charlestown, Massachusetts for nearly 40 years, and now he savors the pleasures of rural life of which allows time for writing, reading, gardening, and volunteer work at the Waterford Library and Historical Society. That's right. Both of which he's a board member and friends of the City Brook, where he serves as acting president. So I love this quote you included, so I'd like to read that. Research into history opens the door to so many stories, stories which add flesh and blood to historical facts. Thorough research is necessary to portray accurately an era from the past, whether it be 200 years ago or just last year. I'm particularly fond of historical fiction, and when I read that, that's exactly why I love to read it, because authors who write historical fiction, generally speaking, do all the work in all the years of research, and then come up with this beautiful story as they see it in their, their minds. So please welcome Robert Spencer. That's quite an, quite an introduction and thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you uh, gave everybody some idea of <coughs> who I am, which is uh, what people are very interested in. They, we write books, we authors, we write books, but uh, oftentimes people are more interested or as equally as interested in where we come from, who we are, how did we get the experience of, of uh, being able to write. And um, I, I'd have to say that my background um, as a landscape architect, um, which was a, a later, in li I, I became a landscape architect later in life. Uh, we turned to school after, I've got my degree in, in English and with a minor in history from the University of Massachusetts, but that was back in uh, 1972, okay? So in 1986, I went back to school and I had done a number of jobs, mostly in sales. Uh, so I went, in 1982, I went back to school and got a degree in, in landscape design, landscape history. Uh, opened my own practice, uh, design build, uh, company was called Minerva Design. Uh, <clears throat> and we did residential and occasionally involved in public projects, but for the most part residential. Um, and I think that really, if that helps you to understand where I come from as far as being able to write. Oh, I'm s not supposed to touch that. Um, um, <clears throat> I look at, I'm here in Maine and my books, both of my books so far uh, have been based in Maine. Uh, during the 19th century. And when I write, I'm looking at the landscape. I'm really looking at the landscape or the environment in which people lived back in those days. Um, uh, it, it, it was helpful to me to, uh, during, the, during the 2000, the first decade in 2000, uh, 1999 to 2012, my wife had, and I had a small business, was called uh, Irish Natural Stone. And we spent a lot of time, we actually were so fortunate, we had a house that we bought in the Burren in County Clare. I don't know if everyone knows that, but, and <clears throat> that was our, 
our headquarters away from away from home, and uh, we were over there fortunate to be over there for usually about two months out of every year. Wow. Uh, buying stone, um, touring the landscape, but it was nice to go back because I was able to go back to a, a culture that was older than what we live today in the United States. Uh, I was living in Boston. I was living in Charlestown. Little row houses, uh, well, old row houses, yeah, but yeah. and when I <clears throat> when I went back to Claire, and w would go back to Claire, it would be like going back twenty or thirty years to a different type of of of, of, of environment and a different type of culture. Uh, so it really helped me to see that I had to separate off from from the modern day even more than what I would normally be doing as far as researching history. Uh, she mentioned research. Um, <clears throat> as a historic, as a, 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 a writer of history, uh, not historical novels, research takes as much time as the writing. Um, and the research, uh, sometimes, I'm a research wonk, I think that's the best way to say it. Sometimes I'll sit down to write, and I'll sit down at my computer and I'll sit down and, and I'm going to try to get a thousand words, or two thousand, whatever it is for the day. And I come across something that I don't understand. I'm not clear. I can't really, I can't use it because I don't understand exactly what it's about. So what I'll do is I'll spend the rest of the day researching. Um, I do the bulk of the, I do bulk, I do, I have a lot of, a big library for historic fact. I can, I have the Historical Society in Waterford, which is a, a, a really good resource. Their archives are very, are very well organized and very deep. Um, and I do a lot of research online because there's so many, uh, so many things that are available online now. You can get original documents, uh, not, not just Wikipedia, you know, but if you go to Wikipedia at the end of the, of the article, all the original documents are listed that were sources for that, for that article. Those are what I like. Those are what I want to find. I want to go, and a lot of the time, those, artic those pieces or those, those documents are available online. But, so, I'll tell you a little bit about my books. Well, first, I'll tell you that I'm, I almost was late today. Um, I, it's not easy being an author and <clears throat> selling your own books. Um, I'm with one of uh, four authors today, and all week we have a, a, dis uh, a display at the, uh, at the Fl Freiburg Fair. And we're selling our books at the Freiburg Fair. And today was a great one. Today was a great day because it was uh, uh, re uh, uh, Senior Citizens Day. Oh, yeah. And um, <laughs> everyone is in for free, of course, <laughs> at the over 65. Yeah. And uh, people were buying books like crazy. So I got, got a little, it was a little difficult to get out. But anyway, <laughs> let me tell you a little bit about my books. I'm, I'm gonna, I'll do some reading, but. It's so wonderful to have live audience. Um, uh, I've been online so much in the I last know. two years uh, to be able, I don't think I've had one live uh, event at a library in the last 18 months. So it's a, a pleasure to be here. But what I did find that by doing all those, all those events online is that people like to hear the words, they like to get some idea of how the reading in the books go, but they also want to know how they came about. Uh, so I'll give you a little introduction to my books. Uh, <clears throat> 2018, I retired in 2013. I didn't know what I was going to do. I, I, I wanted to do something. I'd been in business for, for my whole life and uh, <clears throat> I wanted to get out and, and my wife and I had a house, we had an old mill building that we owned up in uh, Waterford and it was, had been dilapidated, it was falling into the, str to the stream. We bought it in 76 and <clears throat> we had gradually brought the building up so that we could live there seasonally and then uh, in 13 when we retired we sold our house in Charlestown and we turned the building over to an architect and to um, the, the number of contractors. We kept the outside of the building as good as we could it, 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 as, as a replica of what was there before, but the inside of the building 
We have new plumbing, new insulation, new roof, new windows, new electrical, everything is new and it's tight. So it's, we live there year round. And it's probably warmer in that building than it is in most of the old houses in Waterford. Uh, most people in old houses go to Florida. <laughs> um, but uh, the, so the first book, and I decided I would, I would write something that I always wanted to do with my whole life. And I kept, I wrote poetry, I wrote short stories, I wrote some articles occasionally. And <clears throat> what, so what I decided to do, I said to my wife, I want to write. I want to write something. And whether it turns into uh, uh, profitable or what, that's, that's what I want to do. I'm retired now, and I, so this is what I'm going to do. So, in 2017, so it took me almost four years to figure out what I wanted to do. And in 2017, I was doing some research for the Historical so Society in Waterford, in their museum, the Townhouse Museum. And the, my work was to take um, scrapbooks, old scrapbooks that people had turned in had to, to, the, to the Historical Society, and we we're supposed to go through and list each page in the scrapbook and what was on the page um, and take, take copies of it um, if, if it was important enough to put into the archives. And out of the, out of the book you know, came a, a letter, an envelope with a letter inside. And it was a letter that was written in 1953 by a woman, uh, Mrs. Fogg, who lived in California. She was about 90 at that time. And the woman who's put the book together, the scrapbook together, had asked her about a, a woman that she may have known years ago. Now, she'd been in California for like 50 years, so her memory may not have been as clear as, as it would have been if she was, if it wasn't so far away. Plus, she's 90, so, I mean, I'm, I'm 74, and you know, I, I'm, I'm having some problems remembering things sometimes myself, so you get to be 90, it may be the same thing, but... She, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, yeah. There you go. So you, you know what I mean, right? <laughs> I think we all do. Yeah, senior moments they call them. Um, but the, the 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 I opened up the envelope. I took the the faded letter out, and it was the letter that told the story of a woman by the name of Lizzie Millet. Now, Millet's a very common name in Maine, and especially in, in where we live in, in, in southwestern Maine. Lizzie Millet was a woman who was born in 1861. Now, this, this, as a result of my research, I'm finding these dates out. She had a sister named Hattie, and Hattie was born in 1863. But the, the letter was about Lizzie, and it was written in a way that was very judgmental. Uh, as if there was some kind of a, uh, uh, they didn't get along. Lizzie and Mrs. Mrs. Fogg, Mrs. Libby didn't get along. And as I researched, I found out when Mrs. Fogg was a, well, a new Lizzie, Mrs. Fogg was probably about three years old, four years old. So she really didn't understand, but she was very judgmental and put the woman down. And it was a very sad story. Um, I, I liked the story and I shared it with my family and they, they thought it was something that could turn into a good book. So this is the book it became, um, The Spinster's Hope Chest. Um, it takes place, eight, starts 1861, goes to 1888. Um, it happened, most of this happens, so the, the early part of it happens in my, my neighborhood, in South Waterford. Um, the, the house that the, that the girls were born in is still there. It doesn't look exactly the same. It's had a lot of outbuildings added onto it, but it's still there on uh, on uh, Mill Hill Road. And she, uh, her father was a ne'er do well. He liked to work in the woods. He liked his alcohol, and he deserted the family. He left the family for a younger woman. His wife died when when the <coughs> when the Two girls were, were uh, six and nine, and the girls were pretty much left on their own. And one of the things that was so interested in reading and researching was in the 1870s, in the 1860s, 1870s, there were no social service agencies in, the, in, in Maine. And so when children were abandoned, 
or left without parents or orphans, the family decided where they would be put. Um, and I found this, a story about an old, uh, uh, nothing to do with these people, but a story about a woman uh, who had a child and she died and the child, the daughter, was um, left to an uncle because the uncle had, was, was older and he had not really been able to take care of himself and they figured it would be good for him to have a young woman with him so that she could keep the house for him and take care of him. So, that, but that, anyway, so, the story uh, starts on a very unhappy note, very, very unhappy note, and um, I'll read you that. Okay, this, the letter is in here, the letter that I, that I found is in here, that's the, that's the first part of the book. Now, I changed the story, this is my story, this is my story, I mean, I wrote, I wrote this, it's, it's fiction, um, but a lot of it is based on, on track. Okay, so the mother's dead. The mother's dead, she's, and uh, this is her funeral. The funeral, as usual, was in the home of the family. And <clears throat> so, it starts. I hate you, hate you, I hate you, the six-year-old Hattie Millet screamed so loud at her father that her dead mother, whose body still lay in a pine coffin on the table, in the center of the parlor, must have surely heard from the other side. The girl waved her arms around as if possessed, screaming and wailing like a banshee. Her father, 32-year-old Sawin Millet, excuse me, Sewell Millet, rushed across the room, grabbed her by the shoulders and shook so hard that one sleeve ripped off her dress. As he was about to hit the girl, nine-year-old sister Lizzie stepped in between. His hand glanced off the taller girl's head, opening a bloody gash just above her ear where his wedding ring struck. The guests at poor Francina Millet's funeral stood in shocked silence. Then two men, the, assailant, the assailant's brother Oren and Hiram Fogg, the girl's grandfather, jumped from their chairs to restrain the man before more harm could be done. Grandfather, grandmother Beattie Fogg and her and her daughter Ella each pulled one girl away from the enraged man. We hate you both, yelled Lizzie from behind her aunt. Hate you and your girlfriend. How could you think to bring her to Marm's funeral? How could you? She pointed to Miss Rose Haskell, a 17-year-old neighbor from Deer Hill, who had too swiftly stepped in to take the place of Francina in Sewell's life. During the service, she had stood at the rear of the room with his parents. Now she was directly behind her boyfriend and her left hand covering her mouth and her right on his shoulder. The other woman in the room stared at the couple and whispered to each other just loudly enough so that their comments were audible to all present. How brazen. Shame on both of them. Their families have dishonored the village. Shame, shame, shame. It was rumored that the two targets of these comments had eloped to New Hampshire to be married in secret, even before a death certificate had been filed. But that was only a rumor. Quickly the widower took Rose's hand and rushed her toward the front door. As they left, he pointed directly at the fogs. I shan't return to this house until you have buried her and taken all her things away. But remember, this is my house not hers. Be done with your duty as quickly as possible. Hell of a start of life, huh? <laughs> yeah, um, so that, that's, the, that's, that's the start. Um, and <clears throat> it gets better. She, she, Lizzie and Hattie live in several different places with uncles and aunts, and finally they all, they end up with the grandmother and the grandfather who lived in Westbrook. And uh, her grandfather owned uh, what's, what's now called, what was later called Pride's Quarry, which is a Pride's Corner on 302 or, you know, in, um, in Westbrook. It's um, near the drive-in theater on 302. And um, he, he started running that in the 40s, 1840s. Um, and uh, so they end up living with them. And from that point on, they actually start to make some headway in their life. And, 
Lizzie especially uh, is an independent woman, and she um, she get, makes it her own life and becomes actually a, a an entrepreneur. Um, but anyway, so the second one, prospects. Okay, Irish natural stone we talked about. I guess I'm I really like stone. I have to admit it. It's like uh, it's a, a something that the a, a mania, I guess, or, or a hobby. Uh, <clears throat> my dad taught me how to build stone walls when, when uh, <clears throat> down in, in Middleborough, Massachusetts, where where I was born and raised. And he was he was a farmer, but what he liked to do as much as farm is he liked to build work with stone. And so I learned some there and then when I really got into it was in landscaping when we do the landscape design I would design build almost every job that we had or that I had was involved like stone walls paving patios um, pillars uh, standing stones that type of thing especially when I came back from Ireland standing stones and, and more more uh, Celtic type designs but when I moved up to Maine uh, I continued doing that, but I also continued looking, I started looking at, uh, at, at the geology and <clears throat> getting involved in digging stones, looking for stones, looking for minerals, looking for d gems and that sort of thing. In my neighborhood, there used to be a mine in my neighborhood in South Waterford called the Beach Hill Mica Mine. That's where these pieces come from. The Beach Hill Mica Mine was opened in, uh, opened in 1902 and closed down for good in, um, look at the pieces coming up, in, in, in uh, 1920. It, at, in 1902, the, the Federal Bureau of Mines uh, inspected it. The inspector said it potentially had the greatest amount of, of profitability in any mine that he knew of in Maine. By 1905, however, it was closed down for a number of years because they couldn't find enough really good quality mica to turn it into a profitable venture. They kept trying it. It was tried again and again and again. Finally, they just gave up. It's still there. It's a hole in the ground. But these pieces of, here, I'll show you. These pieces of mica, uh, this, this is uh, called muscovite, and that's biotite. This is what we usually think of as mica. But this is also mica, and it comes from that. They both come from the same mine. So, and pieces will come off, and sometimes, what, after you hold it, uh, wipe your hands off because you get little piece filaments. And if you like me, sometimes I'll rub my face, and it'll get in my face or in my eye, and it's irritating. But anyway, the reason I bring that up is because prospects is the story of a man by the name of Clarence Leslie Potter. Now, he was a real person. He was born in Yarmouth, Nova Scotia. He um, moved to, his, his family was in mining in, in Nova Scotia, iron mining. He moved with his wife to uh, Ontario, way out in the northern Ontario. And, it, and this was in the 1850s. So it, it was backwards. It was just, it was a backwards. Before copper was discovered, which turned the whole place into an industrial site. But um, he was also, so he was involved in discovering copper mines, um, building railroads. He was also a blacksmith. Um, he wasn't doing very well up in, up in Ontario because he wasn't, he could only work two or three months of the year because winters were so bad. And the other times, he, he, they weren't able to get enough earnings to feed his kids, feed his family. So he, he found out about this, this on the cover. This is the picture of the first tourmaline found at Mount Mica in, uh, in West Paris, Maine, in, in uh, 1820, the same year the state was incorporated. So it's a 200th anniversary not only of the state, but also of the finding of the first gem in, in the state. And this, was, this is in the um, permanent collection of the uh, Natural History Museum in, in New York City. And they gave me a license to use this on the cover. And so he found out, Clarence Potter 
got a hold of a pamphlet that was printed in 1896 by the great grandson of the man who discovered this. And he put it out, it was distributed in England, it was distributed in France and around the United States, called The History of Mount Micah and the Fabulous Tourmalines. And, and he, this man up in, May, in, uh, in Ontario came upon a, a copy. Now, this is my story. Some of that's real. So I don't know whether he found it or it seems like he would have. Uh, um, so he um, read it. He said, maybe I could go down to Maine and I could make a living finding tourmalines, finding topaz, finding amethyst, whatever, you, whatever there's down there. So he came down and um, he came down a couple times to check it out. And then finally in 1899, he moved to, um, to Bethel and worked in a mine in Newry called the Dunton Gem Mine. The Dunton Gem Mine was opened in 1902, closed in 1903, opened again in 1910, closed again, it was open, closed up, back and forth. And that's part of the story of the book. Um, but anyway, so he was, he ended up when the Dunton mine closed down, he ended up as the owner, part owner, and manager of the, the mica mine. So that these pieces of mica come from the mine that the main character um, owned at one point. Um, so that, that's, that's, how that, that's how that started. Okay, Lizzie and Hattie are in this book. The two Millet's kids are uh, da uh, daughter, uh, sisters are in this book. And some of the characters from the first book carry over into this. But basically it's the story of this man. Uh, he's, con he's a conflicted character. He's a conflicted... Pro I, I can't call him a protagonist because I don't really like him. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but he was an interesting character. Uh, uh, stories about him came out in uh, six years ago, five years ago. I did uh, about six months worth of research uh, for a presentation to the Historical Society um, in, uh, in Waterford on the history of mining in just Waterford. Um, everyone knew mining, every place around Waterford had mines, a uh, history of mining. No one really knew if there's anything ever happened in Waterford. So. What, we ended, what I ended up finding was there were nine mills, nine mines in Waterford that were prospects. They, other than the Beach Hill mica mine, the rest of them were just holes in the ground that people found one piece of amethyst that they dug around every few years. They'd dig again looking for more and they never find anything. Or uh, they might have found some feldspar pieces that um, a farmer might have a hole in his back pasture and they'd find feldspar and they would sell it to a feldspar company that would grind it up and they'd make a little bit of cash. Uh, so it was like small time operations. So they weren't really mines. But uh, this one was, and this, uh, this becomes a, a main, one of the main sites uh, of the book. Um, I'm going to read you again. I'm going to start at the beginning in the prologue of this. This is a book about the history of, based on the history of mining, 1897, 1904. However, it's really, it's not really about mining in, in this, than you would look in a textbook, or it's not really about the science of mining. It's more about the mytho mythology of mining, or the romance of mining. What is it that makes someone <coughs> relocate a thousand miles? in order to dig in the ground? What is it that uh, encourages people today to carry a bucket and a shovel and a hammer into the woods on a Saturday afternoon and chip away? What, are they, what brings someone to do that? So basically people are trying to strike it rich psychologically. That's what I think. So there's some examples. Elijah Hamlin and Ezekiel Holmes Strike it rich in Paris, Maine. The two college students are out for a hike on Mount Micah the day that summer vacation is ending in 1820. They come upon a fallen maple tree 
within whose exposed roots are embedded several radiant green tourmalines the size of your thumbnail. The crystals gleam so brightly in the fading sunlight that the young men know for sure it must be as valuable as emeralds in a queen's crown. When they return to the site in the spring, they each carry home bucket after bucket of gemstones. That's the, that's the story. That's the story that is passed down generation to generation. Did they have buckets after buckets? We don't know. I mean, they, they, they found a lot. And that, in, that story is repeated in, in here, but repeated in, uh, with more detail. Um, these, these college kids were out hiking. They were going back to school the next day. Um, or, or in several days, and they found this stones. They go, oh wow, we can come back and get them. Let's go back next day and get some. That night it snowed, eight inches of snow. And so they couldn't get back until the springtime. And so at one point in the book, the, these two girls who are um, uh, Hattie and Lizzie's, uh, well, Hattie's daughter and Lizzie's niece, um, say, those boys must have been driven crazy during, the, during all the time that they had to go back to school waiting for spring to come so they could go out and fill their buckets and bring the goods, bring the goods back. So in Canada, there's another story that this comes out of these, the history of, can, of mining in Canada. There's several books on that. Blacksmith Henry Timmons strikes it rich in Canada. He's setting sections of track near the town of Sudbury, Ontario, for the Central Ontario Railroad in 1880. He throws his 10 pound hammer at a fox that is trying to steal his lunch pail. When he retrieves the tool, he sees it has broken a chip off a gray boulder, revealing that the rock contains silver ore. As he scans the area, he notices that all around him, the ground is littered with these very large boulders of silver gray. He's suddenly very, very wealthy. Now, this is in the history. I, I mean, I, I could make this up. This is like, but this is from history book from the Canadian government has put out about the mining in Canada. So I accept it. Yeah. Um, 1928, and some of you may have heard of this. 1928, Farmer Cummings strikes it rich. He's cultivating potatoes in Albany, Maine. When his hoe hits a huge green stone, as he digs at the stone, he discovers that it is a crystal of emerald mineral barrel that is 19 feet long and four feet wide. Um, this, this, was, this, this was the largest crystal ever, ever found in, in Maine. And for a while, it was the largest barrel crystal ever found in the whole world. And it was so large that they couldn't dig it out without breaking it. So it was broken into three pieces. Um, one of the pieces is in Bethel, outside the, the new Bethel Mineral and Gem Museum. If you, I don't know if you, anyone's been there, but fabulous museum. I mean, it's world class. Um, another, and the other two pieces are down in New York City at the uh, Museum of Natural History. So you see, these are all myths that, that feed the romance of, of, the, of mineral, finding minerals. Frank Parham, you've, all, you've heard Frank Parham, right? Maine's gem man, strikes it rich in October 28, 1972. At the Dunton Mine in Newry, Maine, Frank Parham, Maine's gem man, squeezes his torso into a small pocket in the pegmatite. As his flashlight sweeps over the stony enclosure, the beam glints off large green and orange crystals. He and partner Dean McCrillis expand the opening and remove 200 pounds of jemmy tourmaline. Now that happened, that really happened, okay, 1972. The Dunton mine, which is at the beginning of this book, that's the first mine that Clarence Leslie Potter worked on. It's in Newry. The Dunton, Dunton mine was opened in uh, 1890, no, 1898. Um, by 1902, they, they found gems. They found some, some crystal. And it was actually, for a couple of years, they thought it was for, broke even at least. But then they couldn't find any more, so they shut it down. All right. Uh, it, it was several times over the course of the next um, decades, it was 
opened and then closed again, opened and closed. In 1953, um, miners went in and blasted. They started blasting, and they blasted down enough into the, into the, the into the pegmatite to actually find another wealth of gems, some of which are still in circulation in the, in in, ba in Maine. But it wasn't until 1972, so we're going from like 1898 to 1972 to finally find something that is long-lasting, a source of income for, for people. Now, the same thing happened in Mount, in Mount Micah. Mount Micah was open and closed, open and closed, switched back and forth, different owners, uh, people rented it. Uh, um, and, but it wasn't until... Um, uh, by the name of Gary Freeman, who is uh, a, a miner here who's working right now up in Mount Micah. He's blasting deep, he's digging deep holes, deep, deep holes in the ground. And he's blasting and he's finding he did uh, $3 million worth of, of crystals last year. They made $3 million. But see, so we're talking about a long, long term experience. And so I take my bucket and I go out, I'm going to find something today <laughs> that's going to be worth hundreds of dollars. Um, so that's the, that's, that's, that's the myth. So there are many such true stories about mining that get, get, quick fan, get rich quick fantasies fill the minds of every miner, whether professionals who move from prospect to prospect looking for the mother load or amateurs who tote buckets, spade, and hammer into an abandoned mine on weekends. If only, they say, as the hammer snaps off a piece of quartzite or a blast of dynamite opens the bowels of the earth. If only I could be one of those who finds their fortune in an instant. That's what this book's about. All right, so. Those are my two books. Um, do any of you have crystal, uh, have stone or mineral collections? No? It must be something that's like from Western Maine, <laughs> Oxford <laughs> County. <laughs> because at the, at the fair, everybody has, you know, everyone comes up and says, oh, have you been to this mine? Have you been to that mine? Do you know that store? They make great jewelry, blah, blah, blah. That's like, and so it's, 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 it's the scuttlebutt. It's a, everyone's talking about, about these. Um, so that's the, that's the, um, the story of this. Um, I will read you a little bit. Anybody have any questions for us? Any? Yeah. I do. Um, so going back to the first book. Yep. Tell me who the woman in California is again. Her name is, I'll get it for you. Berthy Fogg Libby. And you found this letter in the Historical Society's... Yes. Um, scrapbook. Scrapbook. Yeah. Right. Is she related, or is that getting too into the story? Is she related to... to Lizzie, or... No, she was just... She was just someone who had, who knew, she was much younger. So she was three, four years old. Well, the, the Lizzie was born in 1861. Right. All right. This woman was, uh, was in, in her, was 90 in 1953. Oh, okay. So they, she knew the family or she knew, the, knew some of the bad stories about the family. Uh, and that's what was that was in the letter. I mean, she. I think she made. I think she was very judgmental. I think yeah. she. I think she lost. Over the fifty years, she really lost the clear memory of what. What actually happened. Yeah. Um, she has Lizzie being a sad, sad person. Uh, this one thing. Uh, she was talkative during the day, but at night her pillow was soaked with tears <laughs> and, that's, and that's how she saw that and, and I didn't see it that way so, um, I think the, one thing that's true for both for both of these books in the third book that's going to come out after the first of the year is that these women are like stronger than they may have been back in the day that they were living and I think I've talked to a number of authors about this, uh, mostly women authors about this. That it's almost a 
responsibility in many ways to be a contemporary writer and to <clears throat> portray women that might not normally have ha had uh, businesses or might not normally have been leaders of the family or may not have been uh, pillars of society or whatever like, like, like the husbands because um, someone told me they bought this book and gave it to their granddaughter because they felt it was a good that Lizzie Millet was a good role model for the granddaughter because Lizzie Millet takes her spinster it's called the spinster's help chest Lizzie Millet when she was six her mother taught her how to spin thread <clears throat> spinning wheel and at, in 1860s 70s 80s the archaic meaning of spinster was a woman of any age, married or unmarried, who contributed either to her family or her community with her craft, and her craft of spinning, they called her a spinster. And so Lizzie's a spinster, and she ends up as a dressmaker. She takes her, her skill that she learned from her mother. She works in um, uh, Saco, Biddeford, in several mills, some cloth mills, and she then eventually sets up her own business. Um, so she's a strong character. Uh, her sister, I think I'm giving away a little bit too much of the story, yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah, I don't want to be a spoiler. That'll be a spoiler. <laughs> I do have another question. The house you live in, your mill, yeah. is that attached to a mine or was it a uh, what kind of mill was it? It was a box factory. A box factory? Yeah, there was a, the foundation, uh, part of the foundation uh, was built, was laid in, um, eight, in uh, 1797. And uh, the mill at that point was a sawmill. It was one of, one of the early sawmills in town. And the houses in the, in, in the neighborhood all have, have, were built with lumber that came from the sawmill. Oh, yeah. Um, and then by the time the Civil War came, uh, a man came back in the Civil War, um, and he um, was Henry Watson was William William W. Watson, and he bought the he got the the mill building as a as a per present from his uh, father-in-law when he married married into the family, and he turned it into a box factory and he ran it for 62 years. Uh, up until 1924, and uh, then they had a fire, and it was rebuilt into a cider mill, and then it was a cider mill up until the 60s, uh, 65, 66, and then it was left abandoned, and not, uh, people kept horses in it, the ponies or whatever were kept in it, in it. Um, but yeah, so it was, but it was a sawmill. It was water powered. Um, it's not water powered anymore. I mean. In 1953, there was such a bad flood in in the village that uh, the dams upstream were totally destroyed, and uh, the water flow from then on was disrupted. Um, but that's but yeah, so it was a box factory. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Well, Can I take one more? Question? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so why does New York have the beautiful gems? Like why why can't Maine have <laughs> We have a beautiful museum, the Maine State Museum. Yeah, that's right. Why did New York get them? They have enough. They, you know? they bought them from I'm the. Sure they did. Right, from the. <laughs> they bought them from the owners of the of the um, of the the Bumpus Mine, which is in Albany. Um, that's where these were found, wow. and when they the, the 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 owners wanted to get the this 14 foot crystal out of the ground so that they could like sell it you know it was just a you know super it's barrel so barrel is, was used primarily if it was ground up barrel could be used was used by the aeronautics industry it was a hard metal you know, and um a metal hardener and so they just happened to buy it. Once it broke up, they didn't know what to do with it, so they bought it. That was a way to keep the door open for the for the mill for the uh, mine owner. Um, but um, a lot of it, I mentioned the mine, the uh, 
museum in, um, in Bethel. Museum in Bethel has gone out and uh, the Stiflers, uh, the owner, founders, and the Stiflers have gone out and bought all over the country, they've bought old collections of stone and crystals and minerals that came from Maine that got oh, great. transferred to California or Arizona or New York State or whatever. So <clears throat> there was like thousands of crystals, thousands of gems, like some, some uh, they have uh, amethyst, they have a piece of amethyst that came from Sweden, Maine, uh, which is next to, <clears throat> next to, to, to my town. And they have a piece of amethyst that's like that big, that big. It's all, it's like uh, when you, you see in the, in the mineral stores or uh, barn sales, you see these crystals, these stones that are broken in half, a geode, and on the inside there's like little tiny crystals all over. This one is like a giant geode. Uh, it's like big crystals of, of this purple color. It's just fantastic. Uh, they also have um, a whole room full of gems, I mean, decorative finished gems that uh, some, the store manager told me they estimated about $3 million worth of, um, of gems that are in these lighted cases that are just, it just takes your breath away to go in and see them. Yeah. But see, that's, that's, that's the myth that I'm trying to write in, right. in prospects. So what is it makes um, all these stories that I found and do my research for that six month period, I just couldn't, t I couldn't put them down. Um, there were just some I never, I could never figure out how to use in the story that didn't fit the storyline. Um, Clarence Leslie Potter <coughs> once um, stole um, three gems from his, from the Dutton mine in, in Newry, and he, this is not in the book, I'm not giving away secrets. So. He, um, and his wife got sick, and they needed to take her to a specialist down in Boston. And he didn't have any money to take her down there, so he took these three gems to um, a friend of his who was also a mineralogist and offered to sell them to him at such a low price that the man said, I can't buy these from you, that's like robbing you, you know. You, if you, you, you need to, if you want to sell these, they should be sold for so much more money and I can't afford it. So he put the gem in, in his pocket and he went down and he pawned them down in New York, down in Boston. And <clears throat> apparently either he lost a ticket or some, something, he went back to collect them. When he had more money, he was going to go back and buy them back again. He went in and the man who ran the shop said, I never heard of you. I'm, I have no idea. I have no idea what you're talking about. We don't have anything like that. So that <clears throat> that was his. That's the way, that's the type of character he was. He's he wasn't. Um, he didn't have it all together. <laughs> <laughs> so, anybody else have any questions? Yeah. Any mines in Lovell? Did he, Lovell? did he what? Any mines in Lovell, Maine? Oh yeah, yeah. There's lots of mines in Lovell, Maine. Yeah. Do you know Lovell? We live there. Oh, you do? We, we did. Oh, Deer Hill. Okay. Uh, sure. d d yeah, Deer Hill in, um, in Lovell is, a, is, a, is a, a great source for amethyst. Um, wow. that's, that's one of the, I uh, just bought my wife um, two uh, set of, earring, of earrings that were made with amethyst that came from Deer Hill. Lord's Hill, Lord's Hill, Deer Hill. There are two hills that are right next to each other. Yeah, oh yeah, and it, but see in Lovell, Everybody, everybody, everybody knows mining. You know, like that. It, it's just it's never rubbed off on us. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, uh, uh, <clears throat> and, that, and everyone, like everyone, has stories about. Uh, my grandmother has yes. had a ring that was made by the, a stone that came from Bethel. You know, mm -hmm. some mine in Bethel. So. Um, I can read more if you want, or I don't don't know what you want to do as far as any, any questions. I hope you brought. Oh, okay. Books. Huh? I hope you brought some books to sell. I didn't hear you. I hope you brought some books to sell. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> and I can sign them. Excellent. <laughs> no, I did. I brought copies. Um, 
And the next one coming out after the first of the year is called um, Another Man Lost. And it's a, it, <coughs> I think it's the end of the Lizzie Millet series. Um, they're not se in series. You can read one book without the other. Um, some people buy, read the second, they go back to the first. Uh, but the, the, the next one is uh, the end of the, the, the series, and, um, because two of the main characters die. Um, and the subtitle is A, a Lot of History and a Little Mystery. <laughs> this is a little different question. There was a tornado in Waterford this summer. Did oh yeah, just two or three weeks ago. Yeah. Oh yeah, uh, I think it was straight. I think it was straight line. Just straight line. Yeah, I think it was straight line. But one house. It was just one house. The Wrights. They're, they're in East Waterford. A big tree came down and crushed both of their cars, smashed the front porch, broke some windows on the front porch, and. Nobody else had any problems. Wow. So I think it was straight line. Yeah. Um, so I, I have books if you want them. Yeah. I do. I have to go and get my That's great. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, Robert. That was great. It's fun. I mean, it's fun to be live. <laughs> Jeez. I know. I know. You're so fortunate to have this. This was a donation. It's great. Yeah. With lights and everything. I mean, well, I get. Well, the lights weren't a <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right.